Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being with us today, September 29th, 2017, for our UNC Cancer Network Community Lunch and Learn Lecture on Cancer. Uh, very glad to have you here. A few preliminaries. If you're having any trouble with the broadcast, you can reach us by email at unccn at unc.edu. Uh, best way to reach us right away is by phone, 919-445-1000. We'll be using Poll Everywhere, and I'll talk about how to use that in just a moment. We've got the connection information there. And you can check us out on the web at unccn.org. You'll find lots of information there, including links to all of our past uh, broadcasts and, and videos of those broadcasts. You can find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, find us on YouTube. All right, we're going to start off this lecture with a question, a poll, and this is anonymous, so uh, make your best guess at what you think the answer is. On average, the annual cost paid by patients for cancer treatment is estimated to be, now if you think this is A, 2,000 to 4,000, you'll put, you'll put in an A. If you think it's 5,000 to 8,000, you'll put in a B, 8,000 to 12,000 a C, or 15,000 to 20,000 a D. The way you do this, there are two ways actually. If you have a computer or a smartphone, you could go to polev.com forward slash UNCCN. And there that would bring up a web page and you'll see this question and you can respond there. And that's a great way to do this. If you, uh, a, lot of, a lot of our listeners prefer to use a, a phone and, and do texting. Any phone that texts can respond to this. So one time only you're going to text the to the number 22333, the letters UNCCN. So the letters UNCCN going to the number 22333. Once you do that, you'll get a little message. It will say join, you'll have joined, and you only need to do that once. Then for the other question, that there'll be a Q&A at the end, you'll be able to respond to that as well as our poll. So uh, then go ahead and respond with A, B, C, or D, depending on which you think is the correct answer. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce our guests today, and then we'll go ahead and uh, come back to that poll and see what your answers are. So we have Benyon Molina, uh, PharmD, BCOP, CPP, clinical, clinical Specialist, Malignant Hematology Clinic at UNC Medical Center. We also have Gene Sellers, RN and MSN, Clinical Administrative Director, UNC Cancer Network, and Jenny Spencer, MSPH Doctoral Candidate, Department of Health Policy and Management, and a Predoctoral Fellow. Welcome to all of you. So glad to have you. you here today. So let's take a look at that question. Let's uh, see. <laughs> we, we, we've got a strong showing on that most expensive category. Uh, so uh, it seems like uh, based on the topic here today, people are already aware that uh, cancer care is not cheap. Yeah. Uh, whether that's the correct answer or not, we're going to let you answer when you get into the presentation. Uh, but but uh, thank you to those of you who have already responded. So we're about 75% on that, that high number and about 25% uh, on the number before that. With that, I want to turn this over to our guests at Understanding Financial Toxicity and Cancer Treatment, and we'll let you take it from there, Jean. Thank you. Thank you. And here's the, uh, the mouse, and if any of you wants to use this as a cursor to point out anything during the presentation, feel free to do that. All right. Thank you so much, Tim. We are thrilled to be here today, and I'm especially thrilled to be able to present with my colleagues, both for you all to hear from a pharmacist as well as a researcher about the effects of financial toxicity and how it really can uh, impact cancer care. I have been an oncology nurse for almost 25 years and in my career I have worked with patients when and been with them when they have initially learned that they do have a cancer diagnosis and I've seen that upon them hearing those words it's malignant there are usually two questions that come to mind First and foremost is they'll ask, am I going to live? And I think that's a very real question and a very appropriate question. But then once it settles in, they'll ultimately ask the question, how am I going to pay for this? And that's what today's theme is about, is the cost of cancer care and the impact that it has on us as <laughs> facing cancer today, uh, cancer diagnosis, 
but also on the impact of the outcomes of the disease and how we're going to get through the treatment and then what's left when treatment is over. So we're really, really happy to be here and to be able to talk about this. And so thank you for joining us. We're going to start with a scenario of a real life situation. However, the, this is an imaginary patient, but we're going to call her DS and we're going to talk about her care today. But what's important for you all to realize is that while this patient may be facing a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer, financial toxicity is relevant to any cancer diagnosis. So we're using this as our example today, and we hope that this will really make it more real for you all. But at the age of 56, DS was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. She was employed at the time as an interior designer, and her husband was on disability. She has a high copay prescription drug coverage. She was not aware that there were resources or are resources that are available to help her. So let's talk about what we can, can do to learn from her experience as she goes through this diagnosis. This is a slide that really speaks to us, and when I say us, those of us who are really interested in financial toxicity, because we're looking at the side effects that cancer patients face when they're going through cancer treatment. And these side effects are such that they are addressed by the physician on a routine basis, such as pain, symptom management. Patients will talk about the side effects of hair loss, uh, having the anxiety, as I said earlier, the anxiety of just the fear of living with a diagnosis and having your whole world change, the fear of dying. That's very, very real. But what we found out is that there's one side effect that is coming to light, a side effect that even, you know, before five years ago that we didn't even talk about, and that is the term financial toxicity. And this is a real side effect. It's just as important as pain, symptom management, anxiety, fear of dying. And it's a side effect that we want to bring to light today so that you will have the confidence and the ability to address it if you're faced with this with a cancer diagnosis, or even into cancer survivorship. Financial toxicity is still going to be real during treatment and after treatment. So what is financial toxicity? Financial toxicity simply describes problems that cancer patients have related to the out-of-pocket cost of treatment. In other words, these are problems that patients, cancer patients have paying for treatment, paying for high copay deductibles, there was a time when our insurance policies really did a good job when it came to caring or taking care of, of associated costs that were re related to cancer treatment, but those days are no longer. And now what we're seeing is that insurance, having insurance, does not eliminate or guarantee that you are not going to have the effects of difficulties paying for your treatment as you're going through cancer care. And this is something that is really, really important because financial toxicity and worrying about how you're going to pay for this and worrying about where the money's going to come from and if you're going to be able to work can really erode your mental and it can erode your physical state. And it can even reach a point where it paralyzes patients and can result in maybe them not even going through treatment. And so this is a real symptom, it's a real side effect, and we know that as we move forward with developing new treatments and new therapies for cancer care, we know that our out-of-pocket costs are increasing, cost sharing is increasing, and we have to be able to factor that in to part of our understanding of how we're going to beat this disease and how we're going to be able to survive when treatment is over. So what is the result of financial toxicity? So we know that cancer treatment is going to affect our ability to work and it's going to affect our ability to pay bills, especially if you are the breadwinner. But what we also know is because of the treatment and some of the side effects that the treatment can have, and the cost associated with it, we may be forced as patients to spend our retirement savings. We may be forced to cut back on food and clothing, especially if we're having to make a difference or a decision related to paying for food for our family and making the decision of whether we're going to pay or have the funds to pay for a specific 
treatment that's been prescribed. We know that it can cause us to miss appointments. It can cause us to have ultimately a delay in care. It can cause us to take fewer medications. And one of the most significant causes that it can have is personal bankruptcy. And the research is showing that, and we realize that, again, this is why it's so very important that we're able to talk about it. So why aren't we talking about the cost of care? So some people may think when they go into a cancer diagnosis that they're, they've got insurance, and they're under that misconception that, oh, I've got insurance, I'm taken care of. Wrong. Not in today's time. They may be afraid that if they bring it to their physician's attention that they may not get the best care that, that is offered. They may have the feeling that I'm not going to talk to my doctor about this. He's already so busy with other things. He doesn't have time. He can't help me. Uh, they may talk to somebody else who has gone through a, what they think is a similar experience, not understanding that even two cases of breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer can be completely different and the payment system associated with the treatment that might be prescribed. And I think the most important and one of the most um, important reasons for patients not to talk about care or the cost associated with care is that they're embarrassed and there is a, a sense of shame. And I can use a real, real live example with this with a patient that I know who went through a bone marrow transplant recently and was working during the time. And at the end of the treatment of, of successfully going through the, the bone marrow transplant, she was forced with an overwhelmingly large uh, bill that was due, not understanding that there were financial counselors that could help her and found that she was turned over to the collection agency. And so seeing this and hearing these stories, and this is just one example of the shame that people go through because they don't know. They are, they're not aware that there are resources that can help them. And so again, we're trying to bring together some some opportunities and increase the level of knowledge that people have, no matter if you're the patient, you're the survivor, or the caregiver, or whoever you may be, to remember that it's okay to bring forward these conversations because there are resources that can help. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Benjamin. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Jean. Um, yeah, so as we've talked about so far, um, financial toxicity is um, very, very important. Um, and it's really uh, becoming more important because cancer treatment is getting uh, more and more expensive. And really, even for the same treatments, cancer, treatment, uh, cancer patients pay more today than they did five or even ten years ago for the same treatments. Um, and we also know that um, insurance coverage um, has gotten more expensive. Um, so having insurance does not ensure that you're going to have adequate coverage for your cancer therapy. Um, and you know, deductibles have doubled over the past 10 years. Um, premiums have gone up. Um, and uh, despite all these increases in cost, uh, oftentimes, as Jean mentioned, patients don't want to discuss cost-related concerns. And oftentimes that's because, you know, as, you know, healthcare uh, practitioners, providers, uh, the environment sometimes is not uh, um, comfortable enough to discuss those things. So oftentimes treatment uh, options are presented to a patient without the associated costs to be able to make informed decisions. So uh, sort of like going to a restaurant, being presented with a menu that doesn't have any prices on it and, and being asked to make certain decisions. Um, so uh, financial toxicity we know also worsens patient outcomes um, and it also leads to not just increasing costs for the patient but for the health system as a whole, uh, making it very difficult to create uh, you know, practices, policies, procedures in place to deal with it. Um, but we do know that discussing costs can um, decrease expenses for the patient. Um, so I think you know, we can't emphasize the importance of being able to discuss uh, these uh, cost-related concerns with uh, your doctor and your care team. But in order to do that, you know, it's important to be able to understand um, the health system to, to a certain degree. And it can be very confusing sometimes when we're talking about 
uh, the different types of insurance plans, and the language itself can be sometimes confusing. Um, so this slide just goes over, you know, uh, insurance plans, you know, on a kind of on a global scale, what they look like. Most of us know that there are medical plans uh, and pharmacy plans. Uh, but when we're talking about insurance, it's very important to be specific. Are we talking about a me the medical plan, which oftentimes covers the uh, doctor's visit co-pays, uh, they cover infusion services in, in, at the hospital, uh, they cover um, other scans like CT scans, x-rays, MRIs, as well as um, inpatient services. Um, so the medical plan covers services given at the hospital, okay, or in your doctor's office. The pharmacy plan, the pharmacy insurance covers uh, services for prescription uh, medications. And so this is cost that is associated with picking up a medication from the pharmacy. So a lot of cancer patients are now getting therapies, chemotherapies that are tablets, oral chemotherapies that are picked up at the pharmacy. Oftentimes the coverage is based on a tiered system. So tier one drugs might be generic medicines that cost anywhere between 10 to $30 per month. So very, very uh, cheap and, and expensive. Whereas higher tier drugs like um, tier four, tier five drugs are, are typically, you know, they can cost hundreds or even thousands of dollars per month. So um, oftentimes patients may have, sometimes patients may have medical coverage, but they may not have pharmacy coverage. So if someone asks you if you have insurance, it's very important to know whether or not you have medical coverage only or you have both medical and pharmacy um, coverage so that you can get the help that you need. Um, and other terminologies you may hear, um, co-payment, so that's, most people know that that is the amount you pay for different healthcare services, whether it be to see your doctor or when you are picking up a, a medication from a pharmacy. Um, and then deductibles are the amount you pay for your medical care before your insurance plans begins. Um, and keep in mind that the deductible um, resets every year, and so it's important to plan for that, knowing when your de deductible will re reset and where you will have to pay for that before you get the uh, service from your insurance. And then co-insurance is actually the percentage of costs you pay for a service that uh, your health insurance covers um, after you've paid your deductible. Um, oftentimes, co-insurance is a percentage, whereas co-payment is the actual amount. So it's important um, to understand what that final price will be. Um, you know, uh, when someone throws out a percentage, it's important to be specific and say, so what will it mean for me? How much will I actually have to pay? Um, and then drug formulary is a list of prescription drugs that are covered by your plan. It's so important, you know, before changing any insurance plans to figure out if the current medicines you're on will be covered by your a new prescription drug plan. As this is especially important when you're switching, you know, uh, from commercial insurance to Medicare plans. And um, if you are in a plan, um, for example, if you have a, an oral chemotherapy drug that is not covered by your drug formulary, your doctor can write a letter to ask the insurance company to pay for that drug because it's very expensive. And so there are ways around that, but it's important to know, um, you know, what your drug formulary covers and what it does not cover. And then finally, specialty tiers, what I sort of talked about earlier. Whenever you hear you know, specialty tier, specialty pharmacy, it's really means expensive, basically. So this is the highest tier for coverage of specialized and expensive medicines. Um, and now I'll kick it off to Jenny to talk about some of the research around um, financial toxicity. Thanks so much. So researchers have started as this uh, problem is gaining more attention to try to figure out um, a couple of basic questions about the issue of financial toxicity. First, we want to know how much does cancer care actually cost? Secondly, researchers trying to understand how many people are affected and what the effects of financial toxicity actually are. So the first question I'm going to talk about is how much does it actually cost for a patient with cancer? And this question is incredibly hard to answer because there's so much variation in types of cancer and in types of insurance and really in where that information is stored by different insurance companies. The best estimate that we can find is that the cost of treatment paid by patients on average is between $5,000 and $8,000 per year. And that's just the part that patients are paying out of pocket. 
But these costs can vary really widely based on the kind of cancer that you have, the kind of insurance that you have, and even characteristics about you. So two patients with the same type of cancer and the exact same insurance may have wildly different out-of-pocket costs to pay for their cancer treatment. So in the question that we had before, a lot of people sort of overestimated what those costs are. But this is only the direct cost of cancer. There are also a lot of indirect costs that need to be considered. For example, a lot of people with cancer miss a great deal of work. So on average, patients miss about 28 days of work just for their treatments and miss around 18 days of work because they're dealing with the symptoms associated with those treatments. And of course, many patients miss more work than that or have to stop working altogether because of their cancer. Patients also have to get to treatment. For a lot of patients, that can be a very far distance or they may have to go almost every day for radiation treatments. So the cost of getting to treatment can be significant as well. And once you get there, you have to pay oftentimes for parking or potentially for lodging if you're traveling out of your own town to go to treatment. Um, so these costs, once you start to add them together, the indirect cost of cancer can be more than $4,000 per year uh, for the average cancer patient, and again, can vary quite widely. So once you start to add that in, the total cost paid by patients can be much higher and much closer to the guesses that everyone made at the beginning of the talk. So the second question we want to ask is how many people are affected by financial toxicity? But financial toxicity itself is a really broad idea, and there are a lot of different definitions. So thinking about how many people have an impact from this, um, you have to think about the different ways that people can measure it. So here are a couple ways that some researchers have chosen to measure this idea. Firstly, one study found that nearly half of patients report losing their income or having a harder time getting by as a result of their cancer. Secondly, we find that about one in three patients report using all or most of their savings to pay for cancer. Another study finds that one in four patients go into debt as a result of their cancer treatment, and that one in five skipped payment on bills or utilities in order to pay for cancer treatments. Finally, one study finds that one in 50 cancer patients file for bankruptcy, which obviously is much higher than the rate of bankruptcy among the general population. So getting back to our patient, DS is on a very similar trajectory to what many other patients experience. She returns to her oncologist and reports that she's having a hard time getting to her appointments because her oncologist is so far away and it is so hard for her to travel there. She also is fairly well off. She has a retirement account and she has an additional income of a, that totals up to about $60,000 a year, but she's still finding it really hard to pay for all of the treatments and to compensate for the fact that she can no longer work and is still caring for her husband. To compensate for this, she starts to eat twice a day instead of three times a day to save extra money, and she can no longer afford to pay for gas, which is one of the reasons she's having a hard time getting to treatment. All of this is really embarrassing for her, and she has a hard time talking to her doctor about it, and doesn't know who else to turn to, and doesn't even want to discuss these issues. So getting back to the third question that researchers are interested in, what are the effects of financial toxicity on patients? And we find that these effects are both physical and mental. So one in six cancer survivors report a high or overwhelming distress as a result of the financial burden from their cancer. And we find that patients who report experiencing financial toxicity measures also report worse physical or mental health than patients who do not experience these. Finally, those patients who report going into bankruptcy as a result of their cancer appear to have a higher risk of mortality than patients who don't have to go into bankruptcy. So some of the other risk factors that are associated with experiencing financial toxicity include the type and stage of cancer that you have. Also things like your income, age, and whether you have a job can put you at higher risk for experiencing financial toxicity. And finally, the type of insurance that you do or don't have can affect how much you pay out of pocket and therefore how likely you are to experience financial toxicity as a result of your cancer. I'm going to go back to Jean. Thank you. Okay, so now we're back to DS again. And upon realizing how anxious 
she is um, over the increasing cost, her provider connects her with a financial counselor. And the financial counselor does a complete assessment, and in doing so, she realizes that her prescription cost is too high, and she does talk about different options with her. Uh, another thing that the financial counselor can also do is look at payment plans for the overall cost of care in terms of being able to manage it more effectively on a monthly budget. And the um, financial counselor understood about the costs associated with lack of transportation or and or the cost associated with gas in covering that. And so she connected her with some resources that were available to provide gas cards. So in doing so, she was able to provide some resources. So that's what we're going to move into now is what is available when we're trying to help patients reduce the financial burden that's associated with cancer care. And we've used an acronym, CARES, here to really start off this section of the presentation. But first it would be for patients to be proactive. Call your insurance agent or call the person if you're with Medicare or Medicaid. There are people that are designated that can actually help you in order to understand the cost that's associated with this and it's just important to begin those conversations and to be an active participant in the plan of care. Ask about financial assistance programs that you may be eligible, knowing that many of the resources that we have out there are not just for folks that fall in a certain category regarding their current uh, budget or how much money they make. They're for a variety of level of, of backgrounds. Request to speak with a financial navigator or a financial counselor within your health system, or it may be that you request to speak with someone in the community that can help you. And also speak with your cancer care team, and which should include a pharmacist. That's why we have been here today. But that's really important because we want people to realize that it's a team that's working to help you with this. It's not just one person. And back to being proactive, that is the key here with being an advocate for yourself. Again, this is a reminder just to talk to your physician and your social worker. Ask to speak with your, the financial counselor. So you can start the conversation with your nurse navigator, your clinic nurse. It may be a patient navigator that you're working with. It may be a, a case manager. But So you, whoever it is, just feel free that to, to go forward and to say, I need help. I am, I am having problems dealing with this. Take an active approach in understanding what the cost is going to be. We encourage our patients, even at the beginning of treatment, it is okay to ask. And it's like Bingham said earlier, when we refer to cancer care, with going into a treatment and selecting from a menu at a restaurant, you would never order things if you didn't understand how much it was going to cost when the bill came. And it's the same with cancer care. But we haven't been good about bringing this forward in the past, and that's where I fe honestly feel that there's going to be a shift as we move forward, because patients need to know what this is going to look like, especially when treatment concludes. Understand uh, about your health insurance and the resources that working with your individual um, insurance agent may be able to provide, as well as if you're with Medicare and Medicaid. There are resources and people that are designated that can help you with this. Most important is organizing your, your medical bills in your EOB statements that will come in at the end of the month and really keep those at a place to where you can be very aware of what the procedure was that you had, what you thought the cost would be that would be covered, and then ask questions if it's not or if you found that you were denied coverage for something, it's okay to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I need to come in, bring your statements in, and sit down with someone to go over them. That's what we have. That's why we have people here that can help you understand and work through these challenges. And then the last one is look at how you might be able to save money on medications. That might be asking your pharmacist or your physician if there's a generic form of medication that might be available. It might be asking if there are samples in the office that they that you could try before you, you take the jump into getting the actual prescription. It also might be that they refer you to discount drug places where you can get the prescription at a less cost. But ask, 
that's the important thing is to know that it's okay to ask. When we look at high value interventions, this is one site that has come forward and it's called Choosing Wisely and we've got the website highlighted on the slide and I'd encourage you to go in and just review this because they really do give tools and resources that will build your confidence to help you have conversations with your provider. And these conversations are centered around asking about support that support that is available by evidence that it's not duplicative, it's free from harm, and it's truly necessary. Again, this is a site that can really ga gauge in helping you have these conversations and feel like that you're an active participant in your plan of care. I use the example that I've often, and I've used this with my own patients, when they're first here that they're, they have a cancer diagnosis. It's even similar to the fact of somebody who has been dropped in a foreign country, they don't speak the language, they don't have a map, yet they need to get from point A to point B to save their life. Well, this is what cancer patients feel, and many of you that have gone through treatment can probably, can probably really identify with, because it's the same feeling. It's that stepping into a new world where it's foreign, you're trying to learn a new language, you're trying to learn the map of navigating, whether it's the health system or your own community cancer center. But it is a time that it's okay to feel uncertain and not to have the confidence to get through it, but there are websites and there are places resources and most important people that can really help guide you. Here are some other resources that we have found that are very popular among the navigators that we have working here at UNC and these are the ones that we would put at the top list of the ones that are most frequently that we refer patients to. The Patient Access Network Foundation has support for high deductibles and high co-pays. Patients must have insurance but being a U.S. citizen is not a requirement, but the in income must fall at or below the 400 to 500 percent of the federal poverty level. The second one, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, is very popular among our patients that are living with or have been diagnosed with leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma. Not only is this uh, website rich in resources for helping patients understand the disease process, but they also have resources that can help patients with medication assistance as well as transportation. Needy meds, I don't know how, um, if Binyam will agree with me or not, but this is one that we refer so many of our patients to, and it is a website that includes free informational programs that help patients who can't afford the cost of their medication. There's a free drug discount card that's available that can offer up to 80% of a discount at more than 65,000 pharmacies nationwide. Anyone can use the card, regardless of their income level or insurance status. Rx Assist is another program that we use, and it's a patient assistance program that is run by a pharmaceutical company that really has the whole database of all of the uh, information that pharmaceutical companies have throughout the country that have um, copay assistance programs or that may have um, drug assistance programs to get um, additional funding for their specific drugs. But that would be another place that you would want to look. Rx Hope, free online patient assistance programs and information, not just on medication, but also on other resources that could be available. One of Us is a website that's dedicated for patients that are facing breast cancer as far as women that are facing gynecological um, malignancies. This is a website that's for women in, in patients in the North Carolina area and they focus on a variety of support for these patients including gas, food, transportation, and utilities. And then the last one we've got mentioned on this slide is the Social Security Compassion and Allowance. And this identifies claims that for the condition may meet the requirement for disability. And oftentimes patients may be going through treatment and not aware that this is even available to them. So we hope you use this list and go back Share it with anyone that if it may not be applicable to you, there might be somebody within your community or your family that you can share it with. A few more resources to um, highlight. 
before we leave, and this is Stomp the Monster. Uh, food, Gas, and Utilities. This is a program just for North Carolinians. There we also have the Cornucopia House in Durham, which provides counseling, gas cards, peer-to-peer -peer support, support with meals, our very own UNC Patient and Family Resource Center, which is in the lobby of the North Carolina Cancer Hospital, with, um, with dedicated folks that can help patients as they're trying to explore resources that are available to them to help manage the cost of care. And then there's a website, Cancer Care, and they, again, look at transportation, home care, and child care. And you finish up. Thank you, Jean. Um, so, you know, I can't emphasize um, uh, the importance of involving your pharmacist and your cancer care team. Uh, you know, I'm privileged enough to work as a pharmacist with cancer patients every day. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of times what patients tell me is, you know, this is great, you know, I'm going to be started on this life-saving therapy, but, you know, what can I do to make sure uh, that I don't, I don't have complications or how can I afford my treatment? Um, and uh, oftentimes your pharmacist can sit down with you and talk to you about helpful and creative ways to cut costs for your medications uh, with, you know, helping uh, triage you or refer you to the various resources that Jean just talked about, which I think are excellent resources various coupons, grants, and, and uh, payment plans. Certain pharmacies, uh, specialty pharmacies, you know, they'll send you a bill. Uh, if you can't afford it, you can actually call and speak with them, and they can kind of talk to you about different payment plans over time instead of you having to incur all of those, the costs all at once. So there, again, asking and involving your, your pharmacist is very important. Um, also, your pharmacist can review your medicines with you, um, help prevent or manage certain side effects of therapy, as well as, you know, uh, prevent drug interactions. Um, there, there can be certain drug interactions or certain really life-threatening side effects that can la land you in the hospital, uh, you know, have you go to the emergency room, and these are just additional costs that you don't want to incur. So having your pharmacist and your care team as a cancer patient, I think, is, is very important. Uh, you know, I always joke a lot of people know their uh, they're barbers, they're hairdressers, they're doctors, but they don't really have a relationship with a pharmacist on their cancer patient. I think this is this this is very very important to do so. Um, and so this is just you know a slide that that can um, illustrate you know the the thought process that we go through when a patient presents with high copay and how we can help them. Um, the first group of patients are patients who may have no prescription insurance. So it says uninsured on the slide. They may have medical insurance, but if they don't have prescription insurance, you know, they they're, uh, may not be able to pay for um, their oral chemotherapy drugs, which, uh, as we know, cancer treatment is moving towards uh, more and more uh, towards being oral chemotherapy. Um, but this does not mean that they can't get the treatment that they need. So it's very important to know that a lot of pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies, as Jean mentioned, they have really good assistance programs. You just need to ask um, and, um, and apply for those programs. Uh, if you have commercial insurance, um, a lot of pharmaceutical companies actually have uh, copay cards available on their websites. Oftentimes, you just have to go to the website and type in your name and diagnosis, and they, you just have to print off the, the insurance, and the copay card and it can serve to pick up the expensive copays that you might have. Um, this is really helpful, even if your copay is $100 or $50. Uh, can really reduce that to ten dollars, five dollars a month, and that can be very, very helpful. But even if you have very high copays into the thousands, it can still really, really be extremely helpful. Obviously, um, if for some reason the pharmaceutical company um, copay cards are not adequate, there are also additional grants, like Jean talked about, Patient Access Network Foundation, Health Well, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and a whole slew of others that can really dramatically drop your your monthly copay. Um, and then for government insurance, and these are usually Medicaid and Medicare, uh, there are slightly different regulations as far as uh, uh, involving the pharmaceutical companies. Oftentimes, Medicaid actually has really great coverage for patients with cancer. However, there are some caveats to keep in mind, especially in North Carolina. Um, for example, some patients will have only family planning Medicaid, which is uh, does not really cover any, you know, cancer treatment. So, you know, you, you may think that you have Medicaid and have a Medicaid ID, but it doesn't actually cover your cancer treatment. Uh, also, Medicaid um, 
you know, it does, you, you do have to turn in your household income uh, periodically. And, you know, even if, you, if you're over their restriction, they're very strict. So um, they may pull you off uh, coverage right away. I just had a patient recently, his um, household income went up by $53 a month. So he was abruptly, you know, pulled off of Medicaid. So we had to help get uh, pharmaceutical assistance programs to cover his oral chemotherapy medicines. Um, and then we have Medicare. So like I said earlier, you may be enrolled in Medicare but not have Medicare Part D, which is the specific uh, uh, portion of Medicare that covers for prescription drugs. And often, unfortunately, Medicare patients, even patients with Medicare Part D, incur a lot of costs with regards to oral chemotherapy drugs, sometimes thousands of dollars per month. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, they don't qualify for those copay card sites I talked about on the pharmaceutical company websites, but they can qualify for free drug assistance from the company or for those grants that you talked about, such as Leukemia Lymphoma Society Patient Assistance Network Foundation. Um, so I know, you know, that obviously there are, um, it's very, very complicated, but the bottom line is there's help for everyone, whether you're uninsured, whether you have commercial insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, you know, speak with someone about your, the costs of your medications, and uh, there are things that we can do to help. Um, and again, um, additional uh, tips to keep in mind, it's very important to follow your treatment and medication schedule. Um, Non-adherence to chemotherapy actually as it contributes to hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Um, and so, you know, if you think about it, if you're not adhering to your therapy, your cancer may progress, your side effect may get worse, and then that additionally costs more money later on down the road. So it's important as much as possible to stick to the therapy that your doctor has prescribed. And then ask for, ask for help to, for travel costs. As everyone has mentioned, you know, if you are not able to get to the treatment, uh, then you know, that's, that's a big problem, and that's really the first place to start is getting you to your doctor's office, getting you to your infusion clinics. Um, and then look for online tools to help you manage um, your money and your budget. Um, the National Council on Aging has an excellent resource called Benefits Checkup. And the website is www.benefitscheckup.org. And they have a lot of great tips to help budget money and additional tips. And we can't overemphasize the importance of getting emotional support. Um, in addition to the cancer diagnosis and the side effects and just a huge change in lifestyle, uh, the financial toxicity, as we mentioned earlier, um, is associated with a lot of anxiety, depression, and it can really um, throw you for a loop. So it's very important to early on, when you're feeling distressed, to say, hey, I need to talk to somebody. Um, I am feeling anxious, I'm feeling depressed, and I need help. It's very important to do that right away um, because you need to be taken care of uh, mentally in order to take care of you know, your cancer diagnosis and manage your budget and so on and so forth. Um, and then look for ways to ease the, the tasks of daily living. Um, ask your neighbors, ask your family, your communities to help you with small tasks like dropping your children to school or you know, helping deliver meals. And so whenever someone asks you for help, don't be afraid, don't be embarrassed to ask for help. It's so important. Um, so in summary, uh, like we talked about, you know, cancer diagnosis is very, very challenging. There is a lot of um, you know, uh, physical and mental distress associated with the cancer diagnosis, but the cost of treatment can make it even harder. And it's really time that we talked about the financial toxicity as a, as, as a side effect of cancer. Um, and if you're experiencing problem, you're not alone. As we talked about, cancer treatment is getting more and more expensive. Um, and so more and more people are impacted by the cost of cancer care. But just like uh, we talked about, um, even though the cancer, the cost of cancer is rising, so are the number of resources. So talk to your provider, talk to financial counselor, talk to your pharmacist about your financial concerns so that you can be connected with resources that can help you. So um, this concludes our presentation. We'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Great. Thank you all. This is, this is incredibly important information for patients and caregivers and clinicians. Uh, so glad that you've been able to share it with us today. Uh, I will go ahead and under, if you could pass the keyboard, sure. please, that would be great. I'll go ahead and advance to our Poll Everywhere slide. 
And just a reminder, if you, uh, jo if, if you joined in at the beginning, then you can go ahead and just start submitting your questions now. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, just go ahead and send those letters UNCCN to the number 22333, and those questions will come in. And we already have one. Uh, where can I find resources available on the Internet if I don't have a computer? And I can take that. This is a question that I get asked so often because I do have the privilege, and I mean that sincerely, of going to some of our sites that are not located in Chapel Hill. And I have heard from so many people who have said, um, nurses especially, that there's concern that lack of the Internet is one of the barriers that their patients often face. And where are they supposed to go? patients, that is, that, that don't have a uh, home computer, when so many of our resources that we're talking about today are all only available online. And we always will refer our patients and we remind our, our outreach sites that the public library is a wonderful place where they can go, where they will find computers, um, and they will find people there that can dedicate time to help them search the internet and to find these resources and to um, make them available. You'll also find on many of the resources that we talked about today, there's a telephone number that's associated with it as well. But you may not be able to get to that telephone number unless you get to the, to get online on the internet. So I really encourage you to seek out your public library and find those resources that way. Thank you so much. I, I had a question I wanted to ask, and then I see we've got another one, and hopefully others will share theirs. So I can imagine as a patient feeling intimidated by bringing up this, this notion of cost, that this could actually compromise my care, uh, maybe result in not getting as, as high a level of treatment if, I, if, in fact, I broach this issue of cost concerns. So is that a reality? Could that complicate, complicate my care, and, and how should this be addressed? So that's a great question. I think it's important to recognize that um, lower cost care doesn't necessarily mean lower quality care. Mm -hmm. Your uh, care team can help you determine, as we mentioned, whether there are uh, ways that they can reduce the cost to you for the exact same care through manufacturer assistance or through getting you qualified for programs. Um, they can also potentially switch you from something like an oral chemotherapy that may be more expensive to another equivalent chemotherapy that is uh, covered by your insurance. And then lastly, um, as Jean mentioned, the Choosing Wisely campaign, thinking about what your preferences are as a patient and what your values are and determining what the best choice is for you, which may not always be the most intensive care. All right. Thank you. And, and I think one of the, the points that, that all of you really drove home was this notion that the financial toxicity itself can impact our, our outcomes as, as a patient, and, and that seems very important and, and something that I, I think would not have necessarily been obvious. Uh, what can individuals do if they want to improve the system overall? Um, I can take that. Mm -hmm. um, one, you know, thing that comes to mind is, especially, you know, uh, for those of us living in North Carolina, there is a, a bill um, being proposed to help um, reduce the cost of oral chemotherapy drugs for patients. And that's called the North Carolina Cancer Treatment Fairness Act. Um, and it's um, House Bill 206. And the idea is that, um, as Jenny mentioned, oral chemotherapy drugs are far more expensive in the way the insurance plans are set up than IV chemotherapy drugs. And um, the legislation would say that insurance companies that pay for cancer treatment have you know similar payment models for IV as they do for oral, which is currently not the case. Mm -hmm. So overall, that will significantly reduce how much patients pay per month for mm -hmm. their cancer medicine. So patients, you know, can um, advocate for that. They can call their senators. They can call their representatives, their state legislators, through the state mm -hmm. legislature, um, and advocate for House Bill Two Zero Six, which is the Cancer Treatment Fairness Act. All so right. That's one, one easy thing they can do today. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, another question. Uh, thank you all for, for submitting these questions. Uh, what about road to recovery? There are only two drivers in our area. I can take that because we just mm -hmm. had that question come up at our cancer committee meeting here at UNC last week. And we're looking at that as a university 
Road to Recovery is a program that's sponsored by the American Cancer Society, and they are struggling with drivers. So when the person who wrote this said there's only two drivers in our area, there are some areas of the state where we have a Road to Recovery program, but there are no drivers. And that's something that, that we're taking seriously as an institution in terms of looking at this because transportation is one of the top barriers to care that patients are facing, especially those that are trying to get here to UNC. I would encourage folks that where there's not a driver to check with your community churches, to, kept, to check with your community nonprofits that may be supporting cancer care, because oftentimes I know in some situations that hospitals have come forward with volunteers that are stepping forward and actually providing transportation for patients. And there's an incredible amount of resources that aren't obviously known in certain communities. So that's where you need to be, again, an advocate for yourself and to reach out and say, hey, you know, I need help. Who can help me? Thank you. And one more, uh, do you have online resources for shared decision making? Sure. So part of the Choosing Wisely campaign has some guides for sort of how to begin the conversation with your doctor to say, mm -hmm. Listen, I've read about this, and I don't know that this is the right decision for me, or I think I might um, uh, might want to opt for a different treatment. Um, and so part of the Choosing Wisely campaign um, that Jean referenced has some of that information. Also, a number of the cancer-specific websites have a guide that you can print out and bring with you of how to begin some conversations with your doctor about specific aspects of your treatment. And I'll share CancerNet, um, which is by a published or is the website is brought to us from ASCO and they have a wonderful section within their website that is dedicated just to efficacy and having patients have the confidence to talk about um, shared decision making and why it's so important and tools and scripted questions. Yeah, I think this is a great question because a lot of times you'll find a lot of resources um, on the internet that may not be very accurate. So realizing some of these resources mentioned, um, obviously, you know, we talked about the Leukemia Lymphoma Society that has a lot of great information about the disease, the treatments. National, National Cancer Institute has a great patient site as well. Um, and um, even the NCCN National Conference of Cancer Network actually has a great patient site. Um, you know, we use it a lot as clinicians, but the patient side is also really great and talks about, you know, what to, how to think about these uh, really difficult diagnoses and, uh, and how to arrive at, at uh, reasonable uh, individualized uh, treatment options. So uh, it's very important that, you know, the resources that you're using are reputable. Right. And we are fortunate that we have uh, the slide deck down from, from this presentation downloadable as a PDF. So if you would like to uh, look at that or share that with others, you can just go to unccn.org and under events, click past. You'll quickly find uh, today's event. And right there, you can download that PDF with all of those different links that our guests have shared today. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. How might clinical trials factor into the financial equation for patients? I think that's a great question. Um, I think it's important to realize that when you are um, agreeing to, uh, you know, enroll in a clinical trial, which I think that there are a lot of great clinical trials, and that's the only way that we can continue to improve cancer treatment. Uh, it's important to ask, you know, what am I going to be responsible for paying and what is the clinical trial going to pay for? Um, sometimes, for example, you know, you may be enrolled in a clinical trial. Well, the clinical trial drug is covered by the, some, by the company, but the labs that are getting drawn might not be, or uh, the associated supportive care medicines might not be. Generally, the, the standard is that the, anything associated with the clinical trial would be covered uh, whereas anything standard of care uh, would be covered like normal through the um, through your insurance plan or other assistance that that would be found, but um, but that that is usually discussed very clearly. But if it's not un understood during the consent process, you do have a right, you know, clearly uh, to um, understand those specifics before um, agreeing to consent to the clinical trial. All right, thank you.
Well, we want to thank, uh, first and foremost, each of you for being here today. Thank you so much. We want to thank uh, the, the General Assembly of North Carolina for their generous support of the University Cancer Research Fund. Uh, we know it here as UCRF, and we want to thank the uh, UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center for, for all of their generous support. We want to thank uh, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and Alan Brown for all the hard work they do behind the scenes to make each of these lectures possible. Uh, we hope you'll join us on October 27th at uh, noon for an update on breast cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship with uh, Dr. Kerry Anders. So we'll look forward to that presentation. You can find out information about all of our upcoming presentations online at unccn.org. You can find out uh, about all of our, our different past lectures, including videos of almost 200 lectures now. And we'll have this one up uh, before long and so that you'll be able to, if you want to review information from this one, and we certainly encourage you to share this with anyone who, who you feel might benefit from what was presented here today. Today. Uh, thank you all, and until next time, uh, we really appreciate all, all of our guests today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Tim.